Okay, so getting back to the topic, again this is the outline slide, uh, we, we saw the water cycle, we saw the, the water problem in all its uh, various dimensions and then we also uh, started looking at some of the solutions in which we looked at rainwater harvesting and how that is um, useful and uh, very important to do. Uh, the uh, Now we are going to uh, also talk about something that is again equally important particularly for uh, the, the, the rest of the water that we need. Uh, so the, the rain water harvesting was mainly in the, in the context of uh, providing adequate drinking water although, although rain water should be harvested for, for more reasons than just drinking water. So taking it further. Uh, how do we ensure that enough water is made available for all the other requirements? And um, in that, I, we, we need to connect back to uh, the water cycle that we studied. Uh, in the water cycle, we studied that uh, you know there is uh, evaporation that happens from the oceans and all many other surfaces as well. It goes as water vapor, which forms clouds, and then the and then there is precipitation and uh, in, in India there is more rain than snow. So uh, it falls down as rain uh, and then it flows over the surface uh, in the form of streams and rivers and back to the ocean. But some of it percolates uh, underground and uh, then underground it follows a much slower pathway uh, to reach the ocean again. So um, the part of this entire hydrological cycle that is useful to human beings in which the water remains of direct use to human beings is from precipitation to the point that the water reaches the ocean. Uh, the, the rest of the part of the hydrological cycle is, is not directly um, uh, accessible to us I mean, we cannot directly get water out of that. Uh, so um, if at all we have to make any any uh, alterations, modifications, then we can only do it from the point of rainfall until the water flows to the sea. Now, uh, I, I had made a passing mention before that uh, in India, uh, we have a monsoon climate where roughly 80 percent of the rainfall happens between the monsoon months which are June to September. The, the southern tip of India has uh, another return monsoon sometime in November, December, uh, but for the most of the subcontinent, uh, this is the situation. So if we manage, so actually 80 percent of the rainfall in just uh, a few months is actually very difficult uh, for us to uh, ensure uh, adequate water supplies throughout the year. Uh, so you have uh, all the rain that uh, simply uh, flows over the surface and reaches the ocean uh, and then the rest of the year uh, you are left with none. So um, there is a, uh, it is a of great importance to uh, ensure that the water actually remains available for the rest of the year. So that can be done by what is known as watershed management. So let us first try to understand what a watershed is and I am sure that many people uh, might have studied these concepts uh, in school. Uh, but uh, again uh, the reason I have put these things and I think some, somebody in the chat had left a message. Uh, that uh, this is uh, um, relevant only to school children and not to engineering students. Um, I, I do not subscribe to that idea because uh, I have observed in many of my classes students have very little uh, recollection of whatever they must have uh, learnt in school. So if I start off at uh, assuming, if I start off assuming that they already know this terminology and everything, uh, it does not work out. Uh, so I invariably have to end up. Uh, going to uh, relatively basic concepts. Uh, so I, I do not I don't think there is any harm in doing that. Uh, you, if, you are, if you feel that your class um, is actually at a much higher level, then, then you, can, uh, you can modify your approach accordingly. But I think it is uh, more common to, um, you know, for students to not remember uh, all these things even if they have done it in school. So uh, let us start uh, by understanding what a watershed is. Uh, the watershed is, is that region uh, of uh, the, the land where the water 
that, that falls on it as rainfall will all drain down to the same point, be it the ocean or be it a lake or be it some other water body. So, the, the, uh, the watershed contains various streams, it may contain rivers um, or rivulets uh, which, which all converge to uh, the same uh, point. So, if you, if you look at this diagram, there is a uh, maybe uh, it is it's not very clear, but there is a dotted line over here. So, any rain that falls on the left of that dotted line, that is on the other side of the ridge would be part of a different watershed. Any rain that falls on the right side of that dotted line would be part of this watershed. So, uh, uh, that, that is the idea of the watershed, uh, it, it is that trough like area uh, where wherever you, uh, wherever you pour water it will all go. Uh, and converge in, in the same place. Okay. So, uh, now these uh, watersheds, um, smaller watersheds are part of larger watersheds. So, uh, maybe the watershed of a small tributary um, is part of uh, the, the watershed of the major river into which that tributary merges. So, uh, you have uh, these some of these watersheds which are very, very large and they span across states. and um, uh, you have even even cities that are included in that. Now, uh, since there are uh, there are cities and uh, roads and everything that are included in, in the watershed, uh, it, there are uh, so many sources of pollution that uh, that are there within the watershed, and so the water uh, along as it flows carries um, uh, maybe maybe some. Uh, so soil uh, eroded soil, maybe some sediments and um, pollutants as well. Now, um, as I said, if you have rain only in uh, 3 or 4 months during the year and all that rain is going to fall on that land and it is going to drain uh, right into the river, um, within a few days it is going to reach the ocean. So, you can uh, depending on which uh, river is nearby, uh, you can calculate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the distance uh, from the ocean and uh, you know assume some some uh, reasonable number for uh, an average velocity of water and you can calculate uh, how many days it is going to take for the water to reach the ocean and typically in ma many places it would be a matter of days uh, not, not much more than that uh, for the water to just be uh, lost. So, the water that goes back into the ocean is not usable for us. Uh, whereas, if you, uh, if the water on the other hand, if it percolates underground, then the flow is much, much slower and the water may take months, years or uh, several centuries to reach the ocean. So, uh, if the, the, the ground water flow is much slower and during the entire time that it is flowing slowly underground, uh, you can always tap it by digging a well or a bore well. So, there is a benefit in, in uh, ensuring more groundwater recharge as opposed to uh, surface runoff. This, this may sound uh, uh, very simple, but uh, if, if, we, if we merely succeed in doing that, uh, I think our country's uh, water problems would be um, a, a lot less severe. So, how do we ensure that, uh, that the water does not get lost within a matter of days after precipitation? So, uh, good practices, good um, uh, management practices throughout the watershed can actually um, enable this to happen. Uh, in that, I want to emphasize the role of uh, plants and natural ecosystems. Uh, if you, uh, you in your uh, course, you might be teaching topics on uh, ecology and biodiversity. So, this is a, a good point where you can relate some of the things learnt over there. Um, the, the need for preservation of natural ecosystems. This is uh, a, a direct reason why we should preserve these natural ecosystems. So, let us see, let's see how uh, plants and uh, natural ecosystems benefit the, the flow of uh, the management of water in the watershed. So, if plants are not present, uh, the raindrops which fall from the sky you know as they as they are released from the clouds they are falling at a terminal velocity which depending on the droplet size may be between uh, 7 to 
30 kilometers per hour and that can be quite a significant impact on the soil. So when you, when that raindrop hits the soil directly and uncovered uh, soil, you see uh, kind of a miniature uh, explosion that you, that happens on the soil and, and soil particles can be ejected upward and horizontally uh, to quite some distance. So that, that impact actually causes lot of um, damage to the soil, the soil loses its structure and uh, it starts the process of erosion. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, if the soil is vegetated, if there is some vegetation on the soil, be it grass or be it trees, uh, the, the, if there are trees, there will be some ground litter, uh, fallen leaves, dead leaves. So uh, all this together, there, the, the trees will intercept the raindrops at the canopy, the rain, rain, rain water will trickle down, uh, fall on the bed of leaves and it will trickle down further to the, uh, to the surface of the soil and uh, the soil damage is prevented. So uh, then again, uh, you know, if there is vegetation on the ground, it, uh, the water that is flowing over the surface, the surface runoff velocity also uh, is controlled, which again um, limits uh, sheet erosion. Uh, the roots uh, of the plants will, will hold uh, the soil uh, tightly and prevent uh, uh, further erosion and loss of soil. Now, uh, when you have a vegetated soil uh, with roots inside the soil, it is living soil. So there are creatures that, that are present in the soil which are making burrows into the soil, uh, making sure that um, they, uh, the soil remains uh, porous and aerated. So when you have these, these burrows in the soil it in, and the porosity of the soil is high, naturally it, it allows for more percolation of groundwater underground. So in, instead of having an impervious um, uh, layer of, uh, of hard uh, soil, uh, over which um, most of the water is going to run off. Now you have uh, a sponge-like soil which will absorb some water and, uh, and encourage percolation. So uh, when, when water actually percolates underground, it is following the slower path to the ocean in which it remains usable for a longer period. Uh, so uh, moreover, the plant, uh, uh, plants growing over that add humus to the, uh, to the soil which improves the soil fertility and its productivity um, and um, many plants even fix nitrogen. So um, you have, you have uh, better productivity out of the soil. Now um, so when you have uh, less erosion and you have less, um, um, less damage to the soil, uh, the, the silt uh, load is also reduced. Uh, one, one problem that uh, many dams are facing today is that uh, the dams uh, silt uh, due to erosion uh, from the hill slopes. Uh, see, when there is deforestation in the catchment of a dam, the catchment is that part of the watershed which is above a dam, uh, upstream from the dam. So in the catchment, when there is a lot of deforestation, uh, trees are, are cut, uh, the uh, hill slopes are burnt. Uh, many people burn these hill slopes uh, to, to clear the vegetation and to ensure that they get good grass in the following season, uh, but that uh, leads to a lot of erosion right after the rains and all that uh, soil, that, uh, that uh, silt that uh, comes along with the water goes and collects in the dam. So the dam's reservoir capacity um, reduces. The benefits that the dam was going to give uh, during its lifespan uh, also reduces, its lifespan reduces. So again you have to go for desilting of dams. Uh, which becomes expensive. So that's an additional cost. So in the, in the lifetime of the dam, the cost benefit uh, ratio is very adversely affected. So um, if the soil is vegetated, uh, then uh, the erosion uh, is reduced and uh, during, uh, and the soil also um, becomes quite productive. So I have uh, the, all the points that we, uh, we uh, just now uh, discussed, I have summarized them in a table. Um, where we compare barren land versus vegetated land. So you see that direct impact of uh, raindrops on soil on barren land, yes you have direct impact and on vegetated land you don't have direct impact. So uh, then all these points like so loss of soil structure and erosion in barren land you have it, in uh, vegetated land you don't. 
this is just for um, some easy reference. Okay. Now, uh, so the most important thing to do in a watershed is to ensure adequate vegetation, uh, natural habitats. Um, if, if they are preserved, then naturally you have taken the first step towards uh, ensuring good water supplies. If you have uh, deforested uh, hill slopes in the uh, watershed, then you have taken the first step wrong. Uh, so then after that what follows is that um, the, the water that is um, then flowing downward in the watershed, we must try to slow it down because as the water flows faster, it has more kinetic energy, it can uh, lead to greater erosion. So, we have to slow it and we have to store as much as possible. So, this can be done by, by making surface tanks or we can make percolation tanks which are like small ponds, uh, small buns and things like that. There are various structures which I am going to show you a, a nice video for. The extraction of groundwater again has to be limited because if you over extract, uh, then it is going to uh, deplete the aquifer and an aquifer is uh, shared by uh, a large number of people. Uh, it, it is possible for one or two uh, entities to over extract water and inconvenience a, a, a large population. For example, a, a large possibly a cement plant or uh, a thermal power station can you know over extract resources and uh, or some agricultural age area. Uh, you know they can over extract water and they can deplete the aquifer which adversely affects everybody else. Now instead of going through um, the, the various structures, the engineering structures that are, that are uh, normally uh, made uh, or followed in uh, watershed management. Okay. So we are trying to make more water available uh, for, uh, for people. So, um, that, that, that is done by slowing down the flow of water after precipitation and uh, trying to store it wherever possible. So, it all starts with protection of vegetation in the catchment. Uh, so, that is uh, control of deforestation, uh, control of overgrazing and of fire. Then um, if there is a slope, the water tends to flow and gather speed as it, as it flows down. So, it is better to terrace uh, the slopes. Uh, so that the water kind of slows down over there and at the and the uh, periphery of the uh, terraces or along contours uh, they they normally dig trenches and they put the soil on the downward side so it forms kind of a bund and those bunds can can be planted with uh, some some plants or some trees so these are uh, planted uh, bunds uh, so there is a trench and a bund so the water that uh, that flows uh, goes along the terrace, uh, slows down, then accumulates in the trench uh, and uh, large amounts of uh, the water uh, tend to percolate underground and recharge the ground water rather than flowing uh, on the surface. Uh, then uh, there are, uh, there are t uh, small tanks that are constructed, there are uh, bunds that are made, percolation tanks. Uh, there are in places uh, in, in, uh, where there are streams, uh, they make uh, check dams to reduce the uh, velocity of water. So, a la large amount of the silt actually gets intercepted there itself uh, rather than going to the, to the larger um, uh, bunds. So, there are various uh, practices that they follow and uh, this can, uh, this can uh, make a lot more water available. Moreover, in the watershed it is important to, uh, uh, to minimize the wastage of water. So, that, that uh, includes choice of crops. So, if a, if a certain region has got uh, less average annual rainfall, then uh, insisting on planting a water hungry crop like uh, bananas or sugar cane or uh, coconuts uh, is, is um, not a good idea at all and in fact, it will end up depleting the ground water. So, the choice of crops is also very important and then the crops that are planted should be um, based on the seasonal availability of water. So, planting something in summer is probably again going to deplete uh, the scarce groundwater resources. So, um, when all these things are, are done, uh, then uh, you, will, you will find that uh, 
quite contrary to the uh, to the situation of large dams where uh, where the people whose land gets submerged they bear the costs they don't get any benefits of the dam and people downstream in the command area of the dam uh, they get uh, benefits from canals and uh, hydroelectric power and what not so uh, in in contrast over here in watersheds the prosperity that uh, that is associated with this project is distributed everywhere more or less evenly so uh, because even even in the uh, in the uh, upper reaches of the uh, river system you have uh, small dams and uh, structures where people have it is at least adequate for people to do their agriculture and their basic meet their basic needs um, one issue though is uh, large dams uh, produce a lot of hydroelectric power and these smaller uh, smaller dams or medium sized dams they don't produce as much uh, but if the uh, uh, provision of energy in a watershed is looked at in a comprehensive manner then by integrating other renewable forms including uh, wind turbines uh, solar and uh, micro hydro or mini hydro projects uh, all together it, it may not be uh, such a bad deal compared to a, a, a large dam. So, um, the, uh, there is another very important point is that these watershed management programs they will not succeed if uh, there is no community involvement. So, there should be uh, education of the community, awareness creation for the community, there should be um, uh, empowerment of the community. So, the community should run the project themselves, it is not like uh, if you are expecting the government to, to do everything, it will probably not happen in the best possible way uh, and uh, the funds might uh, simply get wasted. But when the community takes ownership of it uh, and they, they contribute their labor also and they, they ensure that it is done, uh, then it, it can actually be successful. There are, uh, there are uh, really amazing success stories uh, in, in this area. and. I am going to show you uh, the video of uh, this um, place called Hivare Bazar where uh, there was, um, it was a uh, village uh, like many other villages where due to uh, scarcity of water and rampant um, uh, crime and uh, alcohol problems and other gender related issues, um, it was a, probably a horrible place to live. Uh, but um, due to the initiative taken by the villagers over there uh, it has it has now completely it is now a changed place and uh, the village boasts of something like 52 millionaires uh, in that village so that is uh, that is so uh, so uh, good to know so let's let's watch this uh, nice video So I hope you like this uh, video. There are uh, there are several such places in uh, in India. Uh, several environmental heroes, social heroes. Uh, in uh, I mean, they, they they are around every corner. We just don't happen to see them. And I think uh, you know I think media gives uh, too much attention to the problems uh, that we have. Uh, maybe. Uh, some attention is required even here uh, to uh, to appreciate their efforts uh, what, what a what a wonderful work they have done uh, there are uh, there are other examples at radegan siddhi also uh, i have personally visited um, many many years ago and i was really impressed by uh, what all has been achieved over there uh, that that again is a is a similar um, uh, place uh, where uh, rainfall is low and all these problems that they talked about uh, it's pretty much uh, used to be there uh, until uh, Anna Hazare uh, came over there and uh, did what he has done. So uh, I, I think it is important to identify uh, local examples so that uh, it uh, it impacts students in a bigger way. Uh, but at the same time, uh, showing some examples from across the country is also useful. Okay, I just, uh, I had made a mention of how uh, for uh, centuries people have been, uh, people have developed very nice methods of uh, conserving water, of uh, storing water. Uh, 
uh, in uh, various parts of the country. Uh, this, this kind of lists down uh, some, some examples and this is not comprehensive uh, uh, at all. Uh, so you can feel free to add more to this uh, and uh, do make it a point to discuss these things with your students uh, so that uh, we actually uh, learn together. Um, there is uh, another uh, activity that you could probably do with your students and um, uh, that is uh, to identify which watershed you belong. Uh, I am sure your, your, your city or village or town or wherever, wherever you are located is part of some watershed. Uh, so it is um, it's a good idea to try to identify uh, which watershed you belong to and uh, then classify whether what type of a watershed it is and what are the major issues uh, in that watershed. You can identify some government agencies uh, to get this information or some uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and then when you know uh, that there are some issues, uh, maybe you can contribute in some small way uh, to, towards the various efforts for restoration of the watershed um, by, by forming the citizens groups um, or, or even through your nature clubs. Uh, I, th I think most colleges will certainly have uh, nature clubs. So once we have um, adequate water um, available, how do we then uh, maximize uh, its benefit uh, and how do we uh, use it efficiently? So uh, that is the second part. So in the, in the first part, we decide, uh, we, uh, um, we made sure that adequate water was made available and then in the second part, we are going to see uh, how to use it efficiently. So uh, let us look at uh, why we need all that water. So we need uh, water for three major uh, end use sectors that is agriculture, industry and domestic consumption. And the, the numbers are roughly as uh, seen on the slides there, agriculture is roughly 87 percent, industry is about 8 percent and out of that 8 percent, 7 percent is for thermoelectric generation. So the 1 percent um, is uh, for rest of the industry and um, uh, domestic is a, a mere uh, 5 percent. So I have uh, I, put in the reference over there so you can you can refer to that um, source. So once we get an idea of where the water is actually required, you know, then we'll know uh, we can think better of uh, how to use it more efficiently. So if 87% uh, of the water that we extract from all the various sources is going for agriculture, then um, uh, we right away we notice that uh, water, agriculture, food, and waste they are all inseparable, they are very closely related and they should be considered together to evolve solutions. Um, and again, I am I'm, uh, I'm repeating what I have said before that more than 50 percent of the food comes from the irrigated land which is only 35 percent of the land uh, and we have roughly 30 percent of degraded land. So um, what can we do then? Uh, we can actually um, we need to develop organic polycultures or agro ecosystems uh, which are water efficient, they are low input. So uh, agriculture requiring too many inputs be it in the form of irrigation or being it, be it in the form of um, fertilizers and other agrochemicals is, is not going to work out in the long run because of the environmental impacts and I am going to discuss a little more about that in the, in the topic on food. Uh, on Friday, I believe. So, um, uh, what, what can really revolutionize uh, this area is uh, a low input organic polycultures. Uh, by polycultures, I mean different species of, uh, of crop plants uh, grown together, uh, which, can, which can provide high yields and uh, at the same time not require so many inputs. Uh, the more the inputs uh, the agricultural system requires, the greater are the environmental impacts. So uh, there are uh, there are cases where uh, the the yields uh, of rain-fed lands can increase uh, from between 15 percent to 150 percent uh, in in these 
uh, low input organic polycultures. Now, uh, it does not mean that it, they will always over yield compared to uh, uh, the uh, previous uh, methods, uh, but if designed well they can uh, they can give very high yields. Now, uh, inputs of organic carbon waste to the soil can uh, improve not only the productivity, but it can also reduce water use because organic uh, uh, carbon in the soil makes the soil hold more water. So, it means the irrigation requirements are uh, somewhat lesser. So, uh, carbonaceous waste, uh, the, or, all the organic waste that comes out of our, our, our kitchens uh, or from, uh, from dairy animals and uh, things like that can be composted and if the compost is added to the soil, then uh, the requirements of fertilizer also reduces and the, um, the solid waste uh, also reduces in volume. Uh, I think uh, depending on the place, um, it would vary, but uh, for the solid waste, I think uh, nearly 50 percent of it would probably be organic and compostable material. Um, and could be as I said you know depending on whether it is urban or rural um, and uh, in various places it would change a bit, but okay it is I think in general maybe safe to assume that it is at least 50 percent in India. So, um, what do I mean by these um, polycultures? Um, there is a I, I, I want to I am debating whether I should show you this video uh, uh, on Friday or today. So, this is a, a, a 300 year old agro ecosystem, it is a food forest in Vietnam. So, it is a forest which uh, looks very much like a forest, but it has all food plants and it has been around for about 300 years with a, with a family. Uh, the, the beauty of this is that uh, of this food forest is that it does not yield only in one layer. So, uh, let us take uh, the example of a, of a rice field or a, or a wheat field. Uh, you have the rice or the wheat that grows um, in, in a certain area and um, you know that that is the only layer uh, that is yielding. But in a food forest, right from the underground layers which is tuber crops, you have tuber crops as well as uh, vegetation that grows. Uh, close to the ground, then you have the herbaceous layer, uh, then you have the creepers and the vines, then you have the shrubs, the short trees, tall trees, some seven layers um, in, in these food forests, each layer uh, giving some, ye some uh, fruit or, or some um, useful product to us. So, it could be yielding either, either food, uh, medicine or fiber like like cotton for instance. So, it could be or maybe wood. Okay. So, there are, there are these various outputs that come from these food forests and uh, they these outputs are derived from various layers within the food forest. So, as a result these, um, these uh, food forests can be enormously more productive than our conventional systems. The beauty of uh, such, uh, such arrangements is that uh, these are perennial systems. Uh, you do not, so if they are perennial systems, it, it means that every season you do not have to plow the soil. If you do not have to plow the soil and add fertilizer and add tremendous uh, amounts of labor every season, I mean that increases the costs. So, this is uh, low input or almost zero input because the seeds fall and uh, new plants uh, again sprout up over there. So, this is a completely different way of uh, thinking about agriculture. These are enormously productive, so we are not taking a hit in productivity. Uh, and again, these are so resilient that they have uh, this this particular example that I'm showing you is um, has been around for 300 years without any problem. So I, I, I guess we'll go ahead and watch this video. So we are back. Um, I will discuss a little more about uh, such systems um, and uh, in the in, in the talk on food uh, later. But uh, I, I want you to to appreciate uh, one thing. You know, uh, I, I'd like to to remember something I, I had told you in the uh, topic on sustainable development, where sustainability requires uh, a, a coordination from different fields. 
So this is something that you see over here. Uh, there is, uh, it, it is a food forest, but it is also a gene bank. Uh, he he uh, mentioned about uh, people coming to their food forest and asking for their genetic material because they are immensely productive uh, uh, agro ecosystems, and that genetic material is extremely valuable. So not only are they uh, are they getting uh, food in a very efficient manner but they are also producing, uh, uh, they are also maintaining uh, a, a gene bank, a living uh, gene bank of these um, materials. Again, all those uh, things about water conservation, uh, since you have trees, there is uh, the canopy interception, uh, recharge of the ground water, all those good things are happening. Then again, uh, the, the inputs are so less because it is, it is well shaded, uh, there are trees which strike deep roots and because they have deep roots, uh, irrigation requirements are very little uh, and uh, of course it is Vietnam so uh, it, it, it rains uh, quite a bit over there. Uh, but such systems, if you have in an agro ecosystem, if you have uh, tree crops then, uh, then generally they are, uh, the, the trees require uh, less frequent irrigation. So the inputs are, are very less and the output is very, very high. So as a result, uh, the, uh, if you put the inputs in the denominator and the output in the numerator, uh, you, you will find that the inputs shrink to a very small number and the output being very high, these systems are uh, highly, uh, highly efficient. So these are, uh, if we develop systems like this and they do not all have to look like uh, this, uh, I think people from uh, Konkan or uh, Kerala, they might uh, uh, they, they might uh, have seen similar systems. There are uh, there are farms which are uh, which actually have uh, things like that. In I have seen personally uh, places in Konkan uh, as well as Kerala, uh, which are similar. So um, uh, they they don't all have to look like this. I mean the species of plants can be different. If you uh, live in a, in a drier uh, parts, then obviously the species would be different. I, I have also seen an example of. Uh, um, a, a similar food forest somewhere near Israel, uh, I, I, I do not remember it uh, properly, but uh, somewhere in the Middle East. So they, they, the, the species that they have are different, uh, but you can still have uh, similar structures, again highly efficient, perennial systems, so you, you are not afraid of uh, them dying out. Uh, recently because of the hail storms in North India, um, the farmers suffered such terrible losses. Uh, can you imagine uh, uh, a food forest like this, if there is a drought for uh, a year or a few years, uh, maybe the herbaceous layer may suffer some losses, but nothing is going to happen to these large trees. Uh, if there is a thunderstorm or some rainstorm, maybe one or two trees may fall over, but it does not destroy the forest. So these are, these are highly resilient uh, systems. So we need resilience, we need resilient systems like that. Okay. So uh, there are there are many things uh, these uh, th that can be uh, done in this and maybe uh, a little more uh, will be covered in the food forest. But uh, basically uh, the the concept of getting maximum output with minimum possible inputs. Inputs I, uh, by inputs I, I mean it in a somewhat of a general sense. Uh, inputs of water, labor, energy, uh, all the inputs that go into agriculture. We need to minimize that and get the maximum uh, output and these uh, such perennial systems are, are very, uh, they score very well on, on those criteria. So uh, that is about uh, uh, something about um, something we can do uh, about agriculture which consumes most of the water. Then about industry, um, uh, rather, than, rather than going uh, in, in detail about industrial wastewater management which probably many textbooks uh, already deal with. Uh, I am just going to take a very superficial but a general um, uh, approach where um, what I am showing uh, here is various uh, items that we purchase. Some of them are food products, some of them are uh, like t-shirts, shoes and things, other products. Uh, they, are, they are all uh, manufactured or they are processed uh, in, in some industry and they require, f uh, they require water for processing them. So there is a, what is known as embodied water, it is the water associated with that product 
uh, which is which the water which was consumed during its production, its distribution and maybe its end of life, its uh, disposal. So uh, 100 grams of potato uh, has 25 liters of associated water, which is the embodied water. Uh, a pair of shoes has 8000 liters. So what this goes to uh, say is that uh, when you shop, you are placing a demand for water. And if you shop for unnecessary items, it is going to uh, uh, it is going to prompt more and more extraction of resources. So just as there is embodied uh, water, there is embodied energy and we have an energy crisis also. So uh, when you shop unnecessarily, when you buy consumer products and uh, most of these consumer products uh, maybe are discarded the same day or maybe within a few days or within a few months. Um, so for, for all, for such a small use that they provide to us, uh, they, you actually have to extract such large quantities of water as well as spend so much energy. So uh, conscious consumption is very, very important. Reducing unnecessary consumption uh, reduces the energy and water crises. Okay. So for uh, industrial water use, uh, specialized treatment is required and um, in fact, uh, uh, again, uh, what we, uh, this is one point that we had uh, earlier discussed is that uh, we, we tend to create problems first and then, uh, uh, then uh, keep ourselves busy in trying to solve them. I don't think that is a very intelligent approach. Um, the more intelligent approach is to, uh, to design our processes and our products so that we do not create a problem. So if green chemistry, green production processes um, can reduce the environmental impacts. So not only about water, it's also about energy, it's also about persistent uh, pollutants, heavy metal pollution, uh, all these factors included. So industries should, should gradually evolve towards uh, recycling their water 100% um, as much as possible. So closed loop production. If, if that can be done, then it will uh, really, uh, you know, that's the direction in which industry needs to evolve uh, that will raise the costs of many products that we use. Uh, but again, if the environment is bearing the cost, presently if the cost is externalized, uh, the, the, what do you mean by externalizing costs? Uh, the price of the product does not include all the costs um, associated with that product. In other words, uh, if uh, in manufacturing a product, if somebody's water gets polluted, somebody's land gets polluted. Uh, that is a cost, but that is not included in the price of the product. So it means that that cost has been externalized. So we find many products which are cheap because costs have been externalized. Somebody else is uh, bearing the cost for giving that product cheaply to you. So uh, sustainability requires environmental protection and even social justice. So externali externalizing costs like that is not consistent with social justice. Why should somebody else uh, bear the cost for uh, the products that we enjoy? So uh, internalizing costs is, is, a, is a positive step. Yes, some products will, have to, will definitely become more expensive, uh, but our economy also has to uh, go through a learning process. I don't think anything is perfect, uh, neither is our economy. So uh, the, what, what's the harm in evolving? Um, so, um, uh, we, we already saw uh, about industrial symbiosis, I, I showed you in the chapter on sustainable development. So uh, sometimes uh, making uh, closed loop systems within one industry may not be uh, possible or it may not be very profitable for the industry, but um, if there is, a, uh, there is a network of industries which are sharing their resources, then it uh, probably would, would work, uh, work out better. Uh, now there are uh, there are uh, some industrial wastes which do not contain uh, very harmful uh, toxic or persistent uh, chemicals and in in those circumstances there are there are low energy alternative ways of uh, of treatment uh, such as uh, you have planted filters you have constructed wetlands um, IIT Bombay has also developed a very nice technique dewatts is another thing so I have I have given uh, several uh, resources. There are cases of industries which have actually closed the water loop. So what do I mean by closing the water loop? That they, they operate in a closed loop. They, they don't, they don't, there are no net 
inputs of water. They, they use the water, uh, they recycle the water entirely. So uh, there, in, in, in that reference, you could, you could go there and uh, just um, maybe uh, read up on uh, the various uh, companies mentioned over there. So uh, we looked at uh, conservation in agriculture, conservation in uh, industry, and now uh, coming to domestic water use. And uh, I have something very interesting to share with you over here, uh, a, a nice uh, video again. Um, water use, uh, domestic water use is only 5%. But if that 5% uh, of water, which ultimately gets converted into sewage, if that goes into a water body, it can spoil very large amounts of water. So uh, e even a, a, a small, uh, let us say a glass full of uh, highly polluted water if poured in a barrel of clean water uh, makes that entire barrel of clean water unfit to drink. So just because it is 5%, it, it uh, does not mean that it is any less important. Uh, it should be treated well. And um, yes, there are. Um, there are interesting ways of treating uh, domestic water. There are some issues, but uh, even the conventional effluent treatment uh, plants have some issues. So uh, there is no running away from issues. Uh, but uh, one thing is that, um, this is again one thing that I told you to keep in mind, is that uh, degraded soils can benefit from organic uh, inputs of organic carbon. And uh, our, um, uh, sewage, domestic sewage contains large quantities of uh, organic uh, matter. So um, can we, uh, can we uh, kind of may tie both ends, you know, at, at one end the soils are uh, lacking organic matter and at the other end the water is polluted because it has organic matter. So why do not we, uh, we tie the two ends? So um, is, it, is it possible to use um, uh, sewage water after some treatment for uh, growing plants, for instance. And it is possible, there are, there are places where people have irrigated using, uh, have, they have, uh, it is not a good idea to grow uh, food crops with uh, sewage water or even reclaimed water uh, because of fear of uh, contamination uh, by pathogens. But uh, there is no harm in growing uh, tree crops for timber or things like that. So. Um, uh, there, there, there is another issue of, uh, I told you about flushing uh, with, uh, with good clean uh, water. Uh, that is uh, uh, not the best idea. In fact, uh, recycled water or reclaimed water, if available, can be used to flush. But uh, you can, uh, as, I, as I said in the sustainability topic, you need to think out of the box. Is it necessary to flush? That is also something that you could, you could ask. And it turns out that many people have thought of it that way. There are composting toilets and in the video on Auroville that we saw, uh, there was a, a composting toilet. That does not look very, um, uh, very suitable for uh, an urban lifestyle, but I have actually seen very comfortable uh, and, and very nice looking uh, composting toilets um, uh, and, and they look very clean. Uh, so they are a, a western style uh, toilet, absolutely clean, it does not smell at all. Um, uh, and um, it is quite effective. So there are uh, composting toilets, there are some available in India, there are some brands which are very expensive, but I am sure um, we are a very uh, innovative lot and uh, things can be made a lot cheaper. Now there are alternative water treatment methods. The conventional water treatment um, costs a lot of energy. Uh, but there are alternative methods and this is where I said you can click the hyperlink and watch uh, videos. Uh, there, are, there are various methods that are uh, listed over here. They are really very interesting. I, I, I request everybody to please in your notebook, please note down um, this slide on alternative water treatment methods and uh, go to each of those hyperlinks and, uh, and check them out for yourself. Uh, they are very interesting methods. I will just tell you what um, uh, these constructed wetlands are. Uh, you have some primary treatment, maybe settle down the, the solids uh, and then you transfer the, the supernatant to a, so this is a, a horizontal flow uh, kind of setup where you have 
uh, some uh, wetland plants that are planted in a in let's say like a trough of um, it's a it's a tank which is like a trough and uh, you have uh, the water coming in and then the cleaned water going out so uh, the microbial colonies that are associated around the roots of these plants uh, they do the magic and uh, you you get uh, reasonably clean water and you can you can obviously have uh, serial arrangement or serial and parallel arrangement of such uh, tank elements uh, so that uh, you get uh, water of the desired quality. So uh, there are again again references and you can follow them. Um, there is uh, one other method that I, I, mm, I liked very much um, and, and I'm just going to quickly explain to you. Uh, this is what we normally do with our uh, domestic sewage. Uh, we have uh, our domestic sewage, we have an effluent treatment plant, we pour in large quantities of electricity in it and we get reclaimed water but we also get some sludge and that sludge um, can pose a pollution problem. It, is, it can be applied to land but then you know it can contain some pollutants. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, this system although it yields reclaimed water, it uh, consumes large quantities of uh, energy. So uh, there is, um, I have uh, cited the source over here, um, this organization has uh, developed a, um, a system where they have an open wetland with ducts and the domestic sewage comes into that open wetland and uh, in the open wetland it is open to the uh, sky so you have sunlight and when you have sunlight you have algae growing on it and then the ducts uh, feed on that uh, and as they feed they are paddling through the, uh, through the pond and because they are paddling through the pond it aerates the pond and moreover with their beaks as they feed they are essentially they are atomizing the water because they want to get to the algae and they want to squeeze out all the water uh, out of their beak so in the process it aerates the water. So uh, the, the aeration costs are zero, uh, the, the flock of ducks uh, is released, uh, they, they are put in a cage at night and in the morning they are released and they rush because they are hungry, they rush to the, to the pond and feed uh, over it, uh, feed on it uh, all, all through the day, come back to the cage and uh, lay eggs. So you get uh, reclaimed water, you get eggs um, um, all uh, for, for doing nothing, uh, just, you just need to have those tanks. And uh, some, the, the gentleman uh, from this organization who had come to uh, uh, our institute, he explained that um, uh, the, the, uh, a case study where uh, the monthly electricity costs for uh, that project uh, were lakhs of rupees and they completely turned around the whole thing and uh, it started yielding a few lakhs of rupees in profits by the uh, selling of those eggs and uh, getting the reclaimed water. Now obviously these, these systems have got uh, problems, there are several problems. Uh, one, one problem would be what if there are persistent organic chemicals in the, in the sewage. Um, so persistent organic chemicals are, are not um, a good idea from a sustainability point of view anyway. So they need to be eliminated. If there are uh, consumer products that are having such chemicals, they need to be phased out. These, these products should not be on the market shelf uh, if we want to uh, talk about sustainability. The, it, it's not. Uh, uh, I mean, it is a self-defeating uh, approach, you know, to talk about sustainability and then um, allow such products to be on the shelf. Unless those things are done, I mean, none of the systems are going to work. Okay, I have just modified that and said that you can, you could take some of the algae and you can, uh, um, th that plant biomass can be converted into energy through either a biogas plant or a pyrolysis plant. Uh, the, so you could you could add more and more elements, but it becomes a more complex system, and then the infrastructure costs may be higher. So you'll have to strike a balance, and that depends on the local conditions, availability of things. And okay, so um, at uh, at Amruta we have been uh, working on uh, similar systems, and uh, this shows uh, uh, how um, your um, solid waste, the organic part of the solid waste, uh, the sewage uh, and um, uh, the, uh, its treatment all can be integrated to yield multiple benefits. Uh, so you can get treated water, 
you can get vermicompost, you can get biogas also and you can make some um, either food or fodder uh, or wood as well as milk. So you can get many outputs and you can tune which one you want more and which one you want less uh, depending on the situation. We started some work, we have a biogas plant and we are taking the effluent from the biogas plant, treating it, uh, this is a, a, a a constructed wetland, it is an experimental setup for a constructed wetland and we uh, take the effluent from the biogas plant and put it into this wetland and uh, you, have, you have three different treatments. This is a simple sand filter uh, and you have two units in series and uh, this is a planted uh, uh, filter uh, and uh, this one has a, a different, a lower bed height. So we are uh, investigating. I have a, a master's student from ETH Switzerland uh, who is, she is an exchange student who has come to Amruta to uh, do her masters. Um, so this is part of her project and it has uh, been going quite successfully. We found a very significant uh, BOD reduction uh, as well as a significant uh, reduction of uh, ammonium. Uh, but Rest of the results are not out yet, so I would rather not uh, comment on that. Um, the last thing I have is uh, a, a small video, um, which is, um, I, I showed you uh, a success story and an environmental hero um, who did some work in villages. But uh, you may say that we are not from villages and we live in cities, so what can we do in cities? Uh, so, uh, here is an example of what you can do in a city. Uh, this gentleman in, in a uh, busy city like uh, Bangalore has used his roof to uh, literally do wonders uh, by recycling water. So, he again the same concept, you know, recycling water and pro producing food uh, are not to be decoupled, but you can do all that in one system. So, he has uh, done that and let us watch this nice video. Okay, so we are almost at the end of uh, this uh, session. I have uh, I have a list of things that we can do over here um, related to water. There are several things that you, as a person, um, maybe as a family, uh, can do. And I have listed down a few things over here, but I, I think uh, your imagination is the limit, uh, and uh, you could think of many more things uh, to do. Um, and uh, make some positive impacts on uh, this issue. Uh, I, I think if you, if you involve students in a constructive way, uh, then uh, this topic will become very, very interesting for the students and uh, I think it will give uh, you also the satisfaction of having contributed uh, in, a, in a significant way. So I have, I have some extra resources you could uh, read upon. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening.